points that I want to make today, three questions I'll be asking you as we go through this topic, evangelism. Number one, what should we be doing? Number two, how should we be doing it? And number three, what are the results? But before we go any further, I need to humble myself before the Lord so he may speak through me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I want to thank you that, Lord, you will use dust to speak through, that you will have a message for your people. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me, Lord, that hearts would be opened, that your Holy Spirit would please be in this place, that people would be motivated, not just to have an intellectual understanding of what is being said, but to bring it into their practical lives. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Great Commission Christian. I don't know if you've heard of this preacher, Dwight L. Moody. Powerful preacher. He's from Massachusetts. He would fill church halls. He would fill circus tents. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people would hear him preach. And thousands of people came to know Christ through this man's preaching. One day he was preaching in a large auditorium, and a teacher came to him and said, I enjoyed your message, but I must say, I'm a local teacher at this school. I'm actually an English teacher, and I noticed that you made 40 grammatical errors during your sermon, and I want to bring that to your attention. Dwight responded by saying, I'm using all the English I know to win souls for Christ. What are you doing with the English that you know? Safe to say, they did not sit with each other at the potluck after church. <laughs> the same question can be asked to us today. What are you doing with the words, the talents, and the time that you've been given? Many of us here today are fruits of evangelism. Some have been given a tract. Some have been invited to a Bible study. Some have seen a flyer in their mail, and some were attracted by that person who's eaten tofu and I need, they needed to know more. That was me. When it comes to evangelism, I wanted to share a few quotes with you that have caught my attention. First one, John Wesley said, the church changes the world not by making converts, but by making disciples. The importance of not looking just for converts but for actually training people to do what Christ designed them to do. Timothy Keller said, bad evangelism says, I'm right, you're wrong, let me tell you about it. <laughs> maybe that's your method, maybe that method has been, worked, has been applied to you. I'm not saying that we need to keep the truth hidden. And yes, there are teachings that are not true, but we need to be tactful in how we go about sharing the truth. I came across this topic of evangelism and I thought, the topic of evangelism, we're going to talk about evangelism to God's people. As a church, do we need to remind God's people about evangelism? My question is this, would a Formula One racing team dedicate a month for speed? They would answer, that's what we do. Would a school dedicate a month to learning? They would respond with, teacher, that's what we do. Might an eagle make special emphasis for a month specifically for flying? The little chicks would say, mommy, that's what we do. Would a fish declare the school, the fish, the fish school, that we have a month of swimming? They would respond, that is what we do. Now I hope when the preacher comes to the church and says, we're doing a month focused on evangelism, you would respond with, that's what we do. We're not the fastest growing denomination because we like to sit on our hands. The church is growing leaps and bounds. Total member involvement is what the catchphrase is throughout the world. Question today is what are you doing? When things get tough, sometimes people like to say, let's talk about the good old days. I used to love to sit by my grandpa's knee 
and he would tell me all about the good old days. He would tell me, Adam, fuel used to be 25 cents a gallon. I don't believe you, Grandpa. That's not the world I'm living in today. He would say, you could get this much candy for a penny. I would say, Grandpa, that's not the world I'm living in today. I don't know what evangelism was like in the 1930s, but I'm told it's something like this. Let's just say Ralph is working downtown, and he sees a sign and a tent go up, and it says, singing evangelist. He'd go to his wife, Ruby. Ruby, I reckon there's a singing evangelist downtown. I think we should go. Well, since I walked home from the factory, and I don't have a long commute, so my evening's available, and because all the stores are closed by five, and because the internet hasn't been invented and the children won't be addicted to their phones and watching Netflix all night, I think they can go. They might even want to go. Honey, let's go. And so they would go to the evangelist's meetings. He would sing a beautiful song, and at some point he would say, during the meetings, now, open your Bibles to Exodus 20, and we're going to talk about the Sabbath. And he would take seven, eight, nine, ten verses, all explaining the importance of keeping the Sabbath. And Ralph would, would lean over to Ruby and say, but our church doesn't believe that. And then she, Ruby would say, but Ralph, that's what the Bible says. You're right. Let's join that church. Is that how easy it is today? Is that the world we're living in today? Now, I want to stop and say, look, I'm all for meetings. I'm excited Pastor Barbara's coming in April. I say we need to do more meetings. I'm telling you now that the soil of the hearts of people is a lot harder, and it's harder to do the work. It's harder to get people in, but God has his people. Amen? Amen. If we pray, God will send us to the people that want to come, that are ready to come, that need to hear the good news. Now, what is something we can do to prepare? Well, the book Desire of Ages says, the very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness. In fulfilling the Lord's commission, to neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual feebleness and decay. Where there's no active labor for others, love wants and faith grows dim. My question to you is this. If we want to not be spiritually feeble, we need to be active. Now the question would be, if we are if we will become feeble if we neglect the act of labor, what will happen to our love and our faith if we are active? The opposite must be true. It will grow, grow, grow. When it comes to evangelism, you can't just go out on your own, in your own strength and in your own power. You need to be filled. No one goes to a garden with an empty water pail. There would be no point. You can't give something away that you don't have. Oftentimes when we spend time with Jesus in the morning, the very things he tells us, the very things he shows us in his word are what we need to share with the people around us. We need to abide in the vine. We need to pray for divine appointments. We need to be filled up so we can pour out something to other people. The Bible says in Proverbs 11.25, the, gender, the generous soul shall be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Now, when it comes to how Jesus did evangelism, I find it interesting that he has had, in the Bible it was recorded, 132 contacts, situations where he was talking to people. Six times he talked to people in the temple, four times he talked to people uh, in the synagogue, and 122 times he spoke to people in the everyday mainstream of life. 122 of the 132 contacts Jesus had with people were in the church or were they outside the church? They did not take a fishing rod with a track out the church window and wait for someone to walk by. They went to see people, to meet their needs, and to see how they could bless. Sometimes our Christian experience can be a lot like the garden I tried to plant a number of years ago. I love beets. I have Ukrainian heritage, I love borscht, I love juicing beets. Beets are great. I know there's some amens out there. <laughs> Either you love them or you don't. But when I was a kid, I didn't have a choice, and I learned to love them. Now, I had this little piece of land, it wasn't mine, I rented it. And I decided I was in a hurry. I had this little, uh, they had these little uh, planter pails with the soil, and I thought, this is easy. All I need to do is sprinkle the beet seeds, cover it, water, God will take care of the rest. 
I'll keep an eye on it. Amen. So, it didn't work like that. What happened was, I planted the beets way too close together in a small container. And guess what happened to those beets? Do you think they grew and they flourished? No, no, the deer wouldn't even eat the tops. <laughs> the, the poor neighbor, the landlord was laughing like, whoa, this, you're a city boy, I can tell, you know? And so I learned a lesson. Now, I'm telling you, we need to be close as a church family. We need to spend time with others, but we also need sometimes to spread out. Stay in the church, but be active in the community. It says, the ministry of healing, trees that are crowded closely together do not grow healthfully and sturdily. The gardener plants them that they may have room to develop, but none need wait until called to some distant field before beginning to help others. Doors of service are open everywhere. All around us are those who need our help. The widow, the orphan, the sick, the dying, the heart sick, the discouraged, the ignorant, and the outcast on every hand. Are there opportunities to serve? There are lots of opportunities to serve. You know, I'm excited for the programs we're having in the church, and we should have them. We should have many of them. But not just those. We need to be going out and sharing. Sometimes we can get so comfortable with other people that we know that we forget how to relate to other people out in the world. I'm not saying you kick down the local bar and start hanging out there, but I am saying talk to that atheist neighbor. Talk to that backslidden Baptist. Who's that neighbor who's shooting hoops? You can shoot hoops with them too. Whatever your talents, whatever your hobbies, share them with other people. They'll be like-minded. Build those relationships. Now, if we want to learn how Jesus dwelt with people and worked with people, we might as well go right to the source. How did he do it? If you have your Bibles, go to John 4, 7 to 10, and follow along with me. John 4, 7 to 10. And the Bible says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus was not ashamed of what he had. He's saying, you're looking for something. I've got something better. As Christians, we should be exuding that kind of influence that we have something that the world wants. Now, Jesus is a genius. I love what he does here. He does something simple as just asking for a favor. Now, you could do a sociological experiment. You could go to the local Safeway and you could wait in the parking lot and you could wait there and say, I want to try to help people put their groceries away in their car. And you could approach people, and in the world we live in today, they could say, the only thing you can help me with is calling security. I can do this myself. A lot of people don't like to be approached because they've had bad things happen to them. However, reverse that, flip that around, and if you were walking out of Safeway with a large, large bag of groceries and you've got apples and oranges falling over the side and you ask for help, oftentimes people will actually give you a hand. People are more willing to give you a hand often than you than accept help from you. Example, there was a lady who was blind. She learned about the Adventist faith. She was excited. However, she could not read. So she went to her neighbors and she said, I have these Bible study guides and I would really appreciate it if you would read them to me. And every week she would go. She was asking a simple favor. Can you read the Bible to me? Little did they know that after seven, eight weeks, they wanted to start coming to church. They wanted to start sharing their faith. And the church grew. This simple act of asking a favor. You know, when I was learning how to give Bible studies, I was thinking, how can I get people to do Bible studies with me? And I remember the teacher saying, I want you to get studies. So I'd go to people and say, my pastor wants me to study the Bible with people. Can you help me? I want to make my pastor happy. And guess what? People would actually do studies with me. <laughs> Ask for a favor. Now, I'm not saying that we just fill up the favor bank and we're always asking for favor. There's also a time to serve. There's also a time to offer help. Evangelism is simply 
offering something better, drawing close to people. What's interesting about this story is this woman, she's there to get water, and then she leaves the conversation forgetting what she was there to get. She leaves the water pot right on the well. And what's interesting about this is that she goes to the town and she proved herself to be a more effective missionary than his own, than Jesus' own disciples. She said, I've met a man. The people in the town might have said, yes, we've seen you with five or six, but what's different about this man? Come and see. And the town was converted. The Bible says that we should seek to save that which was lost. There's something that God has given this church, and it's something called medical missionary work. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to go become a surgeon. God bless the surgeons. doesn't mean that you all have to become doctors. God bless the doctors. We love them. We need them. But to be a medical missionary simply means that I'm willing to help people. My, a lot of my schooling is in nutrition. And as I was learning the Bible, I was learning about different ways to help people. And I came across this man, I was, go, I was going door to door, and he mentioned, my wife, she has a bad headache. Now, was that the time to tell him about the judgment? Was that the time to ask him if he knows what happens when he dies? No, the, the time was to talk about the headache. And I had learned that there's this something called a hot fever bath. Has anyone ever heard of that before? I'm sure maybe someone's grandma has done that to you before when you were younger. I'm telling you, it works. And so I gave him the instructions. He gives his wife a hot fever bath. I come back the next day and he says, praise the Lord, it worked. And we can talk about who's the one that created water. You know, and we can get into a spiritual conversation. When we go and help people, it opens their heart to wanting to know a little bit more. Now, I love gardening, even though I'm not so good at it, but I love drawing lessons from nature. Sometimes when we're doing evangelism, it's a lot like picking berries. You see some on the left or on the top and some on the bottom. Some are ripe and some are not. When we're looking for people, we're just looking for interested hearers. We don't go up to the berries that aren't ripe. We don't shake them. We don't ask them why they're not ready. We simply come back another time. Oftentimes, the best way to pick berries is not with one hand, but with two. And sometimes people can actually pick more than others, and that's okay as long as you're in the field. My grandma showed me this trick. And I thought, Grandma, I hope no one drives by when we're doing this. But she says, Adam, this is the most effective way to pick berries. Adam, you take off your belts, you take an ice cream pail, and you take another ice cream pail, and you put them on the sides here, and then you put your belt back on. And as you're picking, you're able to pick really quick, and you're able to be very efficient. Oftentimes, we don't want to do evangelism because we're worried we'll look funny. We might sound weird. If I was wanting to give Trina a million dollars, people would say, there's nothing wrong with that. But when we give them Christ, they get way more. We're trying to unload heaven on them. We have something better than this world is offering. Evangelism is a lot like picking berries. Now, oftentimes when I was doing Bible work, you'd go to someone's house. They would, let's just say, John Smith has has ordered Bible studies, and you go there, and John gets there, and he says, yeah, I don't really want these. But then, in the background, you can see someone else in the family actually signed up and put John's name, because they were a little ashamed or a little afraid to see what people would think. Oftentimes, among the berries that aren't ripe, when you lift up the bush, you will find ripe berries ready for the picking. We won't be picking berries unless we're actually interacting with people, making friendships. Now, you might ask yourself, you know, I'm interested in possibly doing this, but I do not know where to start. Now, if you go to John chapter 3, verses 8, Jesus has a lesson for us. In John chapter 3, verse 8, I will read you what Jesus says. He says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born by the Spirit. 
Jesus compares the blowing of the wind to the moving of the Spirit. Oftentimes, if we want to do evangelism, we just simply need to look for something. If I want to do, if I want to do windsurfing or flying a kite, what is the one thing from nature that I need to enjoy that? It's the wind. So if someone wants to do evangelism, simply they need to go where the wind is, where the spirit is working. You may not go to the National Council of Atheists at their convention and set up a Bible study stand. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't witness to them, but that's probably not a lot of ripe fruit there at the time. You know, I know working with Pastor Genna and Pastor Felix, you know, they've been busy. I've wanted to like say, let's go for lunch. Every time I try to get a hold of Pastor Felix, he's either on a study or a visit. I can't get a hold of this guy. He's got more Bible studies than I can think of. He's a busy man. Same with Pastor Genna. What's going on, Pastor Genna? I got a study coming into my office. I can't talk right now. There are people actually literally coming into the church. Even this first month, I've seen people come into the church asking about God. There are berries jumping in the bucket. But God wants you to pick them because there's a blessing in it. Now, I've tried surfing before, and I wasn't so good at it. And when the instructor, which was having to exercise the patience of the saints by trying to help me to understand how to do this, he said, don't worry. If you miss this wave, you can get the next one. And so just like evangelism, you wanted to help somewhere, you know, there's something, there's a program that you want to maybe do, but the church isn't doing it, don't worry, we'll find something for you to do. We will take you on a Bible study, we will take you on a visit. If you want to do a small group in your home, I'll help you establish that. We want to help you ride the wind. Now, there was a survey done in Chicago uh, many years ago at a large evangelistic series and they asked people, what is your greatest hindrance to witnessing? 9% of people said, I'm too busy to remember. 28% of people said, I lack the biblical knowledge to do this. I'm not comfortable sharing my faith. 12% said their lives were not reflecting what they believe Jesus would want them to be living. And 51% said, I'm afraid of how the person might react. Fear. Fear is not something that God has asked us to have. He says, you've, you've, God wants to give us power, love, and a sound mind, not to have a spirit of fear. Now, what's so interesting, what it comes to my mind when I think of evangelism, is that Jesus is up on the cross. Those hands that would open the eyes of the blind that will multiply food nailed to a cross. Those feet that brought tidings and came across all the land of Israel now were pinned to a cross he could not move, but they could not pin his mouth. The thief on the cross was there. His heart was open. Even though Jesus was limited, he was using whatever he had to share the gospel. And that man the Bible says we'll be with, with Jesus one day in paradise. The Bible says in Psalm 126.6, He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. As Adventists, we love prophecy. I find that that's sometimes the best door to open to someone. Look, let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. However, oftentimes, for a group that is so excited about prophecy, there's one prophecy that we're actually a part of. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of, shall be preached, then the end will come. We, want to, we love talking about prophecy, but why not be a part of it? A lot of times we think, I can't wait to talk to someone like Daniel when we get to heaven, after the resurrection. But friends, Daniel's going to want to talk to you. He's going to say, you lived in the end times? You got to see all these things happen? You got to see the outpouring of the latter rain? I'm jealous of you. Friends, the latter rain cannot bring to fruition a seed that has not been sown. God cannot bless a friendship that you're not willing to make. God cannot bless literature you're not willing to share. God cannot bless a prayer that you're not willing to offer. And God cannot bless a sermon that you're not willing to preach. 
Here's your chance. As we close, in your bulletin, there's a little card. It says name, it says number, email, and then I would be interested in. We have the deacons that have some pens available. As some soft music plays, and you're impressed to say, you know what, I've been apprehensive, I'm a little nervous to do this. Friends, you want to go door to door, you don't have to say anything. All you have to do is come with me. You want to learn how to do a Bible study, you can come, come with me and sit there and not say anything. But I can guarantee you, as you catch the fever, you will be putting berries into your bucket in no time. Billy Graham once said, the best thing you can say to a preacher is not, I like the sermon, but I have been inspired to do something about what you've said. There are people in Calgary that need to hear the gospel, and God wants to use you. So, as I greet you at the back, and there's a box, I ask that you would put something in, that we may fill our buckets together and rejoice when Jesus comes. Amen?